Hello, everyone, again, and welcome to um, today's free virtual program. My name is Martha Osterbeel, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. And today, we're very excited to be partnering with the Stavros Niarcos Foundation Parkway Theater, home of the Maryland Film Festival, to produce this program. Um, the Parkway Theater is one of many Baltimore theaters highlighted in one of MCHC's newest exhibitions, um, Flickering Treasures, Rediscovering Baltimore's Forgotten Movie Theaters, which combines the contemporary photographs of Baltimore Sun photographer Amy Davis with, um, from her book of the same name with historic photographs and ephemera from our collection to celebrate the golden age of movie theaters and explore how they reflect our values as well as the way we live, consume, and dream. Um, support for this exhibition has been generously provided by PNC Bank. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit the show, um, you can reserve an admissions ticket on our website, mdhistory.org. And um, the Parkway Theater is also the headquarters for the Maryland Film Festival, which is going virtual for the 23rd edition, May 19th through the 27th. Um, MDFF Virtual celebrates emerging to established independent filmmakers and brings moving provocative stories to their audiences. Um, don't miss this incredible nine day celebration of independent film and filmmakers with a lineup of more than 100 feature length and short films, online special events, interactive filmmaker sessions and more. So plan to join May 19th to the 27th online um, in the SNF Parkway Virtual Theater. And so now I'm pleased to introduce you all to Joe Trapea, I'm Curator of Film and Photographs at the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and Christy Lamaster, Artistic Director at the SNF Parkway Theater and Maryland Film Festival. Um, Joe and Christy will be guiding today's conversation, um, and I'm now going to introduce our special guests. Um, so Karen Chin is an independent producer and distributor committed to bold voices and innovative forms that help build radical practices of ethical filmmaking. In 2020, Karen began a producing collaboration with Oscar-nominated Louverture Films. Karen is the recipient of many awards, including the inaugural Cinereach Producing Award, the Piaget Independent Spirit Producers Award, and is a four-time nominee of the Independent Spirit Awards. Karen has produced 10 features as well as interactive media and museum installations starring women and people of color, including Circumstance, The Exploding Girl, and The Motel. Karen is the president and co-founder of Art and Action, a global production company specializing in shoots in Europe and Asia. Karen is also the founder and president of Degenerate Films, the leading distributor of independent contemporary Chinese cinema. Karen is the residency director of the Nevada City Film Festival Filmmaker Residency Program designed to support independent film producers. And Karen is also actively involved in teaching, advising, um, or consulting for organizations including Sundance Collab, ADOC, Center for Asian American Media, and Film Independent. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, and Scott Iman, last but not least, um, is a film historian, author, book editor, and art critic who specializes in the golden age of Hollywood. Um, he's won multiple writing awards for his feature writing, film, and literacy criticism, including the 2014 National Board of Review William K. Everson Award for Film History for his body of work. He is also a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Scott is an adjunct professor of film history at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida, and has lectured extensively around the world, including the National Film Theater in London, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Moscow Film Theater. He's done the commentary tracks for many DVDs, including Trouble in Paradise, My Darling Clementine, and Stagecoach. His most recent book, Cary Grant, A Brilliant Disguise, offers a captivating look at this Hollywood legend. 
Scott also writes pieces for Film Comment, as well as book reviews for the Wall Street Journal. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Chicago Tribune, as well as every film magazine extinct or still exit. Um, welcome, Scott. And um, now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Joe and Christy um, to get today's conversation going. All right. Thank you, Martha. And thank you, Scott and Karen and Christy for, for doing this with us today. Um, really excited to talk about uh, movie theaters and exhibition with you to celebrate um, our Flickering Treasures exhibition and also to once again plug the upcoming Maryland Film Festival. We're so happy to have them participating with us in this program today. So um, I will start by getting historical and uh, I'll start with a question that's mostly aimed at Scott, but you know, anyone please feel free to, to join in. I so much enjoyed Scott's book, uh, The Speed of Sound. And I know a bunch of my friends uh, have also enjoyed the book. It's such a great history of filmmaking. Um, one of the main points of your book, Scott, is that um, sound film didn't evolve out of silent movies. It grew alongside silence. Um, you call it a less fragile strain or a mutation, at which I love. And um, I'm wondering if we could talk about how the industry has historically been limited by technology or shaped by technology and the implications of that. To make a broad generalization, the industry has generally been dragged kicking and screaming into new technology. Uh, they were dragged kicking and screaming into sound. They were dragged kicking into screaming with widescreen. They were uh, dragged kicking into screaming into digital. Uh, I expect uh, whatever turns out to be the, the latest permutation of are there going to be theaters or are there not going to be theaters, they'll also be drag kicking and screaming into that. Because as the industry stable, uh, industry grows, then stabilizes, grows, then stabilizes, there's a natural uh, 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 bent towards not rocking the boat because they just went through a convulsion. That happened with sound, it happened with the advent of television in the late 40s and early 50s, and it's happening all over again now. The sound and, and uh, television were the two uh, 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 coronary events in the terms of the American movie industry uh, up till now, and this 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 is the uh, <laughs> this is the coronary event and the stroke <laughs> and the and the hangnail uh, uh, of the American movie industry. What we're going through now. Um, I'm wondering uh, if we could talk about um, uh, vertical integration and and the global market shifts. Um, can, can you discuss uh, vertical integration as once the norm, but then once uh, then verboten, like a bad thing? And now it seems to be back as the norm. So both uh, Karen and Scott can, can please chime in on this one. Go ahead, go ahead, Karen. I don't, I don't have the knowledge that Scott has with the history, which I'd love to hear. I would love to hear it. Um, I, would, I will say that, you know, I entered the film industry around 2000 at the turn of the millennium. So for me in the independent film side, a really big technological shift was the waning of DVDs. And that was a technology, but also a ancillary uh, revenue stream that propped up the entire film industry. So when DVDs started to wane, the sales of DVDs started to wane, um, it, was like, it was like pulling the rug out from the movie business. So instantly budgets collapsed. Um, the amount of money you know, people could be paid, it, it affected everything. So as a producer, you know, I started as a producer, but very quickly had to learn how to distribute my own films. And now I distribute films from China to North America, um, but I often say this because I, I have seen it firsthand, which is that distribution determines everything else. When you talk to young filmmakers, they usually want to talk to you about financing. How do you get a film financed? And that's normally a first or second time filmmaker 
that's the primary obstacle that they're facing. How do I get the money to make my film? But if you talk to anybody who goes beyond that, they primarily want to talk about distribution because they know that's where the true bottleneck is. So that bottleneck has only intensified in what you're talking about um, in terms of this, you know, whether it's a return or just a turn to vertical integration. So vertical integration means when one company owns the entire supply chain, right? And in the movie business, that's from development through exhibition. So that's developing the, the project, it's producing it, it's the production of it, it's the distribution of it and the exhibition, whether physical or virtual, right? So we, we now have this situation where these, um, you have these major companies that like Disney and Netflix, Amazon, where they are vertically integrated in a way that, that drives them also to acquire other companies. So there's this, the vertical in integration has either been driven by or paralleled with a um, trend towards consolidation. So you've seen the number of movie studios go from something like nine to six. So this, this is um, something I'd love to talk more about, but I, I would love to hear Scott's point of view on this too, especially the, the um, earlier part. Well, vertical integration was a, was a beautiful thing from the point of view of the corporations because it meant they controlled all aspects of the process. As you said, from development to uh, uh, the making of the movie to distribution of the movie. Uh, which meant that even if a film technically lost money, distribution still took their 25 or 30 percent off the top, of, uh, 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 and 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 that went to the bottom line of the overall corporation. And vertical just uh, vertical integration. It was, for instance, Metro Goldwyn Mayer (MGM) was actually the filmmaking subsidiary of Lowe's Theaters. It was not the other way around. Uh, Lowe's uh, Marcus Lowe set up Metro Goldwyn Mayer to make films uh, uh, as, an, as the uh, production expression of Lowe's theaters. And it stayed that way and all the theaters had a similar, uh, similar structure. And it made perfect sense for them because it was another profit stream. Distribution is a separate profit stream from the profits that come from production, really. Uh, and because they were doubling their profit stream, not just from production, the profits on production, but also the, the profits on distribution, they had much less of a chance of losing money. In 1947, an antitrust action had been instituted uh, more than a decade before, and it took 10 years to work its way through the courts. And in 1947, the Supreme Court said, it's a monopoly. So the companies had to divest themselves of their theater chains in 1940s, the beginning in 1947. And it took, give or take 10 years. Lowe's was the last one to do it. Uh, in 19, I believe, 58 or 59. It took, so it took a long time uh, because you had a thousand theaters that had to, you had to find buyers for more than a thousand theaters dispersed all over the country. Uh, so it was a complicated issue. Psychologically, it was a terrible blow because all the people that formed the, the moguls that formed the, the first generation of the filmmaking companies, the Warner Brothers, Louis B. Mayer at MGM, uh, uh, Harry Cohn of Columbia, they all began an exhibition, every single one of them, Adolf Zucker at Paramount. Uh, they all were exhibitors and they only went into production as a means of getting, uh, uh, controlling the flow of product because they sat there every week watching movies that they were buying to show in their theaters. And some of them were good and some of them were lousy. And at some point people will say to themselves, I can do better than this. <laughs> and, and so they went into production. You know, and in many cases they could do better than that. Uh, in some cases they didn't, but but that was the impetus because it also was another revenue stream from just running movie theaters, which has a ceiling on it depending upon how many bodies you get into the building. But because they'd been an exhibition, they all knew what put butts in seats. They all knew what made a movie spark the audience. So they were more successful in many respects than a lot of the people that had been making the films they were putting in their theaters, the, you know, the other, just the other uh, production companies, which is why the companies lasted for, in some cases, a hundred years and going strong. In other cases, not so long, uh, but they all were flourishing 
up until the Supreme Court decision of 1947, which was a huge blow psychologically and also in terms of income stream. And then basically almost simultaneously television lands with both feet, which began diverting huge amounts of the audience uh, into avoiding movies and staying home. Was television, early television as good as the movies? No, but it was a lot cheaper. And after the war, you had millions of people coming back from Europe and Asia and the South Pacific and starting up families. And they were less focused on the outside world than they were on, 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 on the home base. So television played right into their psychological and emotional needs as well. And the movie industry had a very diff difficult time uh, 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 figuring out ways to lure the audience back. Here's an interesting statistic. Between 1946 and 1953, the American movie industry lost nearly 50% of its audience in dribs and drabs, 6% one year, 8% another year. But nearly 50% of the audience simply drifted away. And that's an extinction event. You're looking at extinction. So they had to come up, they weren't stupid, uh, but they had to come up with some sort of response that would lure people back into the theater, which is a long answer to a short question. <laughs> That history is really good to know, though. I wonder if um, either you, Scott, or Karen, you would like to kind of just briefly acquaint our audience with the recent change uh, in laws that is maybe kind of going to rebuild back towards vertical um, integration. I don't, I'm curious, Scott's point of view, because I don't know, you know, that the recent turn back to vertical integration preceded the actual change in the law. So you have the streamers who started in, you know, Netflix started in exhibition as I didn't know actually what Scott had just mentioned. It's, I think that's fascinating that all these people came from exhibition. So Netflix started in exhibition by sending out those red envelopes and then um, made the move. I would say that 2014 was a huge year. It was, the, it was when those first three originals I think came out on Netflix and it marked a real turn in the television side of the business um, where a lot of talent and resources started to migrate to the to the series side as opposed to the film side of our business but the law that um, the antitrust law uh, that the paramount decrees as they're known that Scott's referring to, they were overturned, I think last year, or within the last year or two, the, the Department of Justice and the Trump administration brought them up for review and then decided they were no longer relevant. But never mind, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, um, but the change ha started to happen a few years before then anyways. And you also, I mean, it's worth pointing out that because uh, when I wrote my article, Ira Deutschman wrote to me and said, well, you know, there, there were always independent companies that were vertically integrated, like Music Box, um, which produces films and distributes them and has their own theater in Chicago. But it's where it's rare to find like IFC films. It's it was it, it just didn't exist on a on a wide scale like the studio level um, for for many decades. Yeah, and both of those ones you mentioned are relatively very small in comparison to the larger vertically integrated companies that we're speaking of, right? So yeah, I totally hear Ira's point, but there's definitely like a shift. I wonder, Karen and Scott, I'd both really love to hear your perspective on how all of these changes has shifted how we make movies. Um, I know that the consolidation and this new player of um, content creation um, has really shifted some of those things. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Well, the, the, in, in, so let's say the last 10 years. Uh, it's never been easier to make a movie because you can hook up your cell phone and get perfectly adequate images. In some cases, very good images. The problem, I think, nowadays is much more distribution. How do you get people, how do you get eyeballs? How do you get your movie in front of eyeballs? Because that's where the bottleneck is now. The bottleneck used to be financing. That's less of an issue now. The, but the, the bottleneck now is, is distribution. Uh, the, uh, the, the... Go ahead, Karen. You can pick a point. <laughs> I mean, I think every, everything has changed 
so much. I mean, like just starting from the big picture point of view, we are now in an attention economy. That's the economy that films enter the marketplace in. And 50 years ago, when certain distribution structures were created, we were, film was a scarcity. That is absolutely not the case today because as Scott said, anyone can make a, make a, a film with their cell phone. I actually think that's a good thing because there's a lot of interesting work coming from films made by cell phones. That's some of the most interesting filmmaking I'm watching right now. But to get back to um, how, that's, how that's impacted impacting how we make films. So now we're making films where films, uh, where attention is the scarcity. Um, and you have these streamers who are very consumer driven, right? I would say in this economy, the consumer wins. If the consumer wants to watch their movies on their phone, they're going to watch your movies on the phone, right? It's, it's not a filmmaker centered business anymore, um, which is neither, good or, nor bad. I think that there's, it's, a, it's just a real complete shift in the way that we need to look at filmmaking and film production and the business of it. I mean, I just read today, I, I forgot the article, but it said that movie watching uh, was fifth on the list of like way far down on the list of what most people spend their time on. And that the first thing was gaming. It's not even television, like gaming has taken over, right? And then it was um, music and then social media and then television and then film. So that of course impacts every way that we should be thinking about this business. When I started with an independent film, I would say the mantra was this like field of dreams kind of, you know, fantasy, like if you build it, they will come. So people would just make, you know, first time uh, filmmakers would get $2 million to make their films. I mean, that has actually kind of returned, interestingly enough. You see first time filmmakers on Netflix, for example, getting a sizable budget to make a film. Um, but the economics and the reasons for that have really shifted. Karen, as a, as a filmmaker myself, I really bristle at the idea that we're supposed to make films to fit a screen this small. And it just seems um, like physiologically, medically, a, a bad idea. It's going to, you know, it's, it's hard to stare at something that small for a prolonged period of time, especially as you age. So, um, but I know that Netflix has been telling filmmakers this for years. I, I remember Joe Swanberg came to the Parkway to uh, premiere his Netflix series. And he, he said Netflix had told him, you know, start thinking small screens. Um, I just wonder how, how sustainable that really is. And um, if this is just a wave that we wait to ride out. <laughs> No, this is a complete generational shift. It's the primary way the entire world watches movies is on their phones. This has already happened. This is not something that is happening. It has already happened. So either we can accept that or we can pretend it's not happening. And, you know, I, I moderated this panel at um, Sundance a couple years ago, and it was a state of the industry panel. And I asked the people, the distributors and the sales agents on that panel, this question, and almost every one of them just tried to deny it was happening. There was only one <laughs> executive who said, yeah, all of my friends in Ohio watch movies on their phones. That's the primary viewing platform. So I don't necessarily think that ev like every filmmaker doesn't have to cater to it, but of course we should be aware of how audiences are watching. And I will say, as someone who is a total cinephile, um, who would watch everything in a movie theater if I could, if I could own a movie theater for my own viewing pleasure, I would, you know? But I am completely agnostic as to where my, the films that I produce and the films that I distribute, where they show. I will work with any exhibition platform because the only thing that is important to me is the audience. It's getting the films to the audiences. and especially for independent film, we have not done a good job of cultivating independent film audiences. We just haven't. And if you look at the way Netflix cultivates certain audiences, it's brilliant. 
and it's not something that is being matched um, on the indie side. So I embrace it because it's already happened. Yeah, I'm- Are we I'm, talking about the difference between films and content though? Uh, to, 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 to refer to Martin Scorsese's screed of some months back about, a con I mean, what we're talking, I mean, if you're, if you're consciously making a movie to be watched on a small screen or a phone, uh, or a computer screen. Aren't you, in, aren't you going to be composing much shallower images? Aren't you going to shoot it in a different way than you would if, unless you're making a domestic drama about people in a room, okay? But that limits the, that, that there's, a, there's a, a watering down, it seems to me, where, where the, uh, uh, the medium becomes not just the message with the content, but what the movie's about is the medium. And I've seen that over the last... Because if you look historically, the backbone of the movies usually was the medium budget domestic drama. Those are the films that people went to see and caught a nerve, whether it's the best years of our lives or ordinary people or, or whatever. Uh, but, but by being shot for a large screen, they were composed and dramatized with more attention to psychological and emotional detail because the audience is seeing more of the people's faces and more of the rooms they're in. And I think by the consistent but steady diminishment of the, literally the screen size, I think that's affected the way the films are written. I think it's affected the way the films are, are shot. And it's also affected the, uh, the kind of responses those things inspire. I think, I think there's always been room for small screen and large screen media, actually. And I appreciate this, uh, different, this differentiation you're making between content and film, but, uh, but, I, but I agree with Karen that like, this has already happened and this is a, this is a factor that we're dealing with. And as, and as someone who programs a cinema that is uh, at the moment closed and in the virtual distribution landscape, I can tell you that, um, you know, for me, the answer is when we reopen, it's about really making sure that we are letting the viewer know that, the, that there are texts that are meant for large screen collective viewing and really eventizing and shifting how we think about movies, right? Like I think that um, I'm really interested in a model that curates a season rather than a plug and play sort of distribution, uh, you know, seven day a week theater. So I think that we have to really start thinking about in this attention economy, like, what makes it valuable for someone to come to a movie theater and what is the experience they're hoping to have? And I think there's definitely a role, but uh, Karen, I think you're right when you say that um, independent movies have never had the bandwidth, um, at least not in the time that I've been programming movies to really be the bread and butter of exhibition, you know? And so we need to find other ways to uh, let people know what the value is in that collective moment. I just think that, you know, this change has already happened. So if you don't, if you choose not to accept the fact that the majority of the world is going to watch your film on their phone, then you are excising yourself as a storyteller from audiences that cannot afford to go to movie theaters, that don't, cannot afford to live in a place that has a movie theater. So the, the phone, opens up the audience globally. And I find that American film professionals often don't have a strong understanding of the global class structure. So the studios or the streamers are fully aware of this. If you look at what Amazon is doing, I wrote about this in my piece, Amazon launched a mobile only viewing platform. It's just for phones. So if I'm producing a film or a series for Amazon here in the US. I know that a billion people in India are watching that on their phone. There's no other way for them to watch it. So, you know, there's a um, interesting new platform fueled by blockchain in India and the audience can curate titles. The number one title on that app that you watch on your phone is Fish Tank by Andrea Arnold. Again, this is the only way they're going to access that film. And I would rather have thousands or tens of thousands of people in India watching that film than none at all, because otherwise they could not afford to watch it in the movie theater. So 
it comes down, unfortunately, to the cost. And in regards to movie theaters, no movie theater can survive by playing independent and foreign language films. Even some of the ones that are the most revered, like Metrograph in New York, I mean, the Sunshine in New York City closed down a couple years ago, right? The Paris had to close and then Netflix bought it for their own use. But if people look at kind of even the very top art house theaters, they survive only through corporate rentals or philanthropy. Um, or they turn to booking these major blockbuster tentpole movies. Now, I would like a film ecosystem that produced more than just Marvel films, mm -hmm. right? And in order to do that, I have to support audiences watching films on any kind of platform that they actually have economic access to. So to me, that's what it's about. It's about it's about the survival, much less the, th the thriving of our film ecosystems. Well, if I, um, if I might turn it um, slightly back toward theaters, if I dare, um, there, was, there was some bad news this week about the Arclight and Pacific theater chains uh, closing for good. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, what do you think is at stake if we lose cinematic exhibition um, the way we knew it pre-COVID? Uh, like, what will you miss the most about it? Losing yourself in the movie. I, 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 and I, I, aside from that, I think you lose a certain visual literacy. It's the difference between looking at a book of Vermeer paintings and looking at Vermeer paintings. When you're, I mean, uh, to see a movie, uh, the theatrical exhibition is the acid test, it seems to me, of movie professionals. It's, it's because it's hard to judge an image when you're looking at this because it, it flattens everything out. It flattens out the color. It flattens out the lighting. It flattens out, I think, the performance, unless it's very carefully composed and planned for this. And it's hard to compose and plan for this. Uh, to me, the acid test of a movie is to see it on a big screen because the flaws become more evident as well as the virtues. So the, the diminishment of the theatrical experience is uh, taking us into, as far as I'm concerned, Death Valley. And who wants to live in Death Valley? <laughs> I don't think that we'll ever be without cinema exhibition because I think that, you know, we, the, the value of that experience is really apparent to people who love it. I just think that we have to think of it more like an opera or stage plays, or we need to create seasons, we need to create context, we need to create, um, you know, curated space for folks. And we need to um, really, uh, like I said before, make the case that like we, we're offering something different. Well, of course, um, the problem is, is the pandemic has basically pulled the power cord out of the wall it's removed people from the habit of going to movies for a year and a half. They're starting to open up now, but who knows how long it's going to take until they're actually open, uh, all open. So but people find out that they can function without that. And that's why there's been a huge in influx into Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Hulu and the rest of the, of the, of the streaming services, uh, which doesn't really help the studios much economically because they're, they're, their lunch is being eaten by Amazon and Netflix and Hulu and the rest of them. They may have a piece of some of those companies, okay? But it's, it's a totally different economic model, totally different economic model. Uh, and as I said, it, it all becomes kind of a part of a 24 seven visual maw, you know, and you, you plug into it, you plug out of it, and it's much easier. We're losing the whole idea of movies as an event or even a quasi event. Let's face it, most movies are far, far from events. Most movies, you can't remember what the name of the movie was uh, two hours after you saw it. But there are those flashes from Olympus where you see a movie and you come out and you're a different person than you were when you went in. And that's much harder to have that kind of uh, 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 chemical response with this. I just wanna say that uh, snow caps and popcorn um, for five and ten dollars was also an acceptable answer to that question. <laughs> um, 
but but seriously, like Karen, what what are you ready to jettison from the virtual pivot, if if anything? Do you see any? Sorry, what do you what do you mean? Well, uh, I mean, th- is there anything about this this thing that we've we all agree has already started happening that you see as a as a um, as a downside to it? I mean, for example, like as a filmmaker myself, I I love to to show up um, for a Q and A and interact with people and. Um, for me personally, the last, I mean, the last year has been a nightmare for everyone, um, but not getting to go to festivals and interact with people watching something I've made is, it feels like a huge loss to me. And um, virtual festivals are great and, and they, you know, but there's still like a difference between a virtual Q&A and really being in a room with people. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is there any uh, d- downside or aspect of the virtual pivot that you would want to get rid of or change? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because I think it will just ha- naturally happen as, I mean, everybody has missed human interaction across the board, whether it's at a film festival or at a restaurant or I miss group interaction. I have not had a social group interaction, I don't know how long. Um, So I don't think that, I agree with Christy very much. I don't think that movie theaters will go away at all. I think there will always be a place. I think what we need to guard against is, I mean, look, opera still exists, right? But how expensive is it a ticket to go to the opera and who can afford it? And what demographic is watching that? So I'm always interested in having as many diverse uh, and different structures of exhibition and distribution as possible. The more, the better, because the more structures we have, that means the more kind of films can be made. You can make films, if a structure exists, then it will drive the production of a film. So for example, if you look at um, uh, Greenland, which I don't know if you guys saw, but that was a disaster thriller movie with um, Gerard Butler. And that came, they pushed the release of that four times. It was either STX or Lionsgate um, released that. They pushed the release four times and they finally released it in December on PVOD. So PVOD is this relatively new kind of uh, VOD where you pay, f- I think it was $20. So, so they made, I would say they're going to net a hundred million dollars on that film that premiered on PVOD. And so that's a film that was made for $40 million in a certain genre with one known actor. Um, So the kind of creation of the PVOD channel is going to drive this kind of film, if that makes sense. It's going to drive this, this class of film because it has a way to be monetized. So this is why I say like as many structures as possible, the closing of the movie theaters for the last 14 months created what is pos- possibly a singular American invention, which is a virtual theatrical release. And there's a, there's a couple places in Scandinavia that started this last March where festivals banded together to support their local art house theaters and they would show films online and half of the ticket sales would go to the the movie theaters. Well, this instantly started to happen in the US too and it's continuing right now. So I have a film that's in virtual theatrical release that has probably done better in virtual theatrical release than it would have done in theatrical release. So that's been really interesting to see. So I hope that that sticks around so that a specific film that is right for that channel has a place to go and, and a place to really shine. If that makes sense. That's a real- the cost of releasing a picture on VOD. Exactly, yep. Much less than the cost of releasing a picture through conventional methods because you don't have prints and advertising to worry about and all that. Well, yeah, so exactly. You're exactly right, Scott. So if, for example, if Greenland would have spent $40 million on a traditional um, release marketing, campaign for its a theatrical release, probably spent $10 million on the PVOD release, right? Because the kind of marketing assets that you're creating is much 
it just goes onto this one kind of digital platform. It's just much Hard. less. Hard. Yeah. Well, this is an excellent segue, Karen, because you let us know that you have a movie in virtual theaters now. I would love to know um, what both of you are working on currently and where we can, uh, you know, see more of your work. I have, so my company, Degenerate Films, is part of Icarus Films, which is a larger distributor. And we have a film in release called Lost Course. It's a documentary that comes from China and it's about, if you can believe it, it's about free and fair elections that happened in a small fishing village in China. And these protests against, land, uh, against corruption turn into free and fair elections, which turn into the protesters being democratically elected as the leaders. And then the, the story follows the, the kind of democratic uh, roller coasters that we've seen. So that film won the equivalent of the um, Academy Award in for Chinese language films. It's called the Golden Horse Award. So that's still in virtual release. And if you go to Icarus Films, you can see the theaters that it's uh, playing at virtually. Scott, do you want to tell us about your current? Well, uh, my Cary Grant book is still out there. It came out at the end of last year. I'll have a book about the history of 20th Century Fox out uh, from Hachette running press uh, at the end of this year. And I'm working on the one after that that'll be out probably in three years uh, now. That's, I'm, I'm always churning something. That's fascinating. I'm currently reading Upton Sinclair Presents William Fox. A uh, very interesting book. Yeah. Very interesting book, which I reference in, in my book. Yep. I had a copy of that signed by Upton Sinclair, I might add. Uh, one of the first things I bought when I was a kid, I bought that at Larry Edmonds bookstore in Hollywood, California. <laughs> Art, original hardcover, the first edition hardcover. Wow. You like it? Uh, I, I like most of it. I, I, it, it. I find that it's making me a little skeptical of Upton Sinclair, which kind of shocked me. <laughs> well, he, he, he just sort of takes Fox's word for everything. And taking to Fox's he's explanations taking. lack something like, makes it sound a little easier than it probably was or skips a few steps. Like Fox, Fox was a, William Fox was a uh, voracious wolf, the wolf of Wall. He was the original wolf of Wall Street. So I know we want to um, save some time for, uh, for questions from our viewers. Um, we, we had a question prepared uh, asking, what do you hope for the film industry? Um, does anyone want to want to want to tackle that <laughs> before we turn it over to the to the audience? Karen, I would love to hear what you hope for the film industry, Scott. <laughs> I would hope for a rational middle ground. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to uh, 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 the idea of everybody walking around. I walk my dog twice a day, and there's always somebody walking their dog paying absolutely no attention to their surroundings. They're completely oblivious and they're watching their phone. They're looking at their phone or they're answering their emails, whatever it is they're doing. Uh, and, you know, the, the, it, I, find that, I, I find that psychological predisposition for people lost in a three inch screen to be uh, a kind of invasion of the body snatchers <laughs> uh, that, that obsessive minutia, that obsessive fascination with a tiny event on a tiny screen. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in to return to what it was in 1945. That's not going to happen. That's gone. That, that's with the wind as it were. Uh, but I am interested in some sort of rational middle ground between, uh, uh, film as we knew it and film as our grandchildren will know it. That's a great answer. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that I wish for, it's, it sounds simple, but I think it's quite radical. And that is as many diverse, different structures of exhibition and distribution as possible. And that's everything from, I wish for there to be movie, cinemas of any, of any format or sort in, in communities that are currently cinema deserts. Um, I just wish for there to be a multiplicity of ways for people to watch films because that will generate a multiplicity of film films to watch. 
Um, so it's the opposite of the kind of consolidation trend that we're seeing. Agreed. Yeah, that, that's really inspiring, Karen. I, I also really, I, I really think that there's a float all boats model, right? I just think we haven't found it. But I think, it, but I think trying to integrate or work with the multiplicity of platforms is really how everyone's going to survive and thrive. And so that's, I'm so with you and I really appreciate your perspective. So um, let's take a few audience questions, if we might. Um, from Lucas, who I think uh, at least half of us here know, um, he asks, uh, what's your all time favorite movie theater? Oh, I love this question because for me, it's easy. It's the Rialto that was in South Pasadena, which is a small town in Los Angeles that I grew up in. And this, this is where I saw some of the films that completely changed my life. And it's the movie theater that's in The Player, the Walt, uh, Robert Altman movie. I have several. I'm sitting Shiva for the Cinerama Dome right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love that place a lot. Uh, I loved uh, 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 the Ziegfeld in New York. I loved. Uh, there's a there's a handful of theaters. I, it was a, the Radio City Music Hall. It's a great place to watch a movie. It shouldn't be, but it is. I think there's something about the proscenium. Uh, there's any number of, of of places I love. So those are a couple. Joe, it's yours. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, I will say that the Elgin in Toronto is one of the most breathtaking places I've seen a movie, but um, on a more home level, um, it would have to be tied with the Parkway and the Charles, which um, at various points in my life have been my neighborhood theaters. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick with the hometown answer. How about you, Christy? Well, I, I do love the Parkway. Let me just say that I've only gotten to see one movie in it so far since I moved here in August. Um, but uh, it's a stunning and beautiful place. My other favorite cinemas are uh, Anthology Film Archives. It's just a place that um, I've seen a million movies that have changed my life and has always felt like a place where it's easy to have conversations and it's easy to meet people and it's easy to really like unpack the movie with people that are also like really invested in doing that. Um, and I also have to just shout out this little uh, private screening room of a man who does cinema exhibition technology named James Bond in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and his, his cinema is called Cinema Borealis. And it is one of the most, because of who he is and what he does, it is one of the most beautiful and perfect small places to see a movie. We're getting some shout outs in the chats. Uh, Anne from upstairs of where I'm sitting says she loves the Rialto. Oh, I love that, that's awesome. So we have a question from Lynn V. Um, do you think movies on the big screen and event type screenings will be completely unavailable to people living in small towns and rural areas? Are they going forward going to be severely limited to seeing films only on their phones or their home screens? I, I would love to take a shot of this, but I, Scott and Karen, I would love to hear your perspective too. I actually think that cinema exhibition because of some distribution structures is maybe a little bit more financially sustainable for people in small cities that don't have um, competition for distribution uh, for the big tent poles. So I don't think that there's gonna be that case. I also really love to shout out uh, this cinema called Film Scene in Iowa City, which has a, um, really large member base that really loves that cinema and really keeps, it's now two, I believe, different spaces afloat. Um, so I don't think that people in small towns are gonna ever be without movies, but I do know that in the shift to digital presentation uh, to GCP that we lost a ton of really um, mom and pop mall cinemas and other small town cinemas. So I'd love to hear Scott and Karen's perspective as well. Uh I, I've gone to a place called Winterset, Iowa, a couple of times in the last 10 years uh, for other reasons. And it's, there's about, I don't know, 3,500, 4,500 people in Winterset, Iowa. 
It's just, it looks like Bedford Falls and it's a wonderful life. You got the town square with the courthouse and it's ringed by all the stores. And outside of that, it's Prairie. Uh, and their theater had been closed for a number of years. And a couple of enterprising uh, people opened it up. The main problem was getting digital projectors in, which you know is expensive uh, because it's the, the studio stopped servicing film a long time ago. So you had to go with DCPs, but they got it done. And they've been open for about three or four years now, about four years now. Uh, and they show what they show, you know, they, they, they show what's available to them and they're doing okay. They're not getting rich, but they're doing okay. So it is possible. It is possible, but you have to be devotional. You know, you have to, you have to you, you light incense at the, at the church of the movie gods. I think uh, you're not going to, it's not something you're going to go into and, uh, and count your, uh, you know, retirement account expanding on a continual basis. But if you really want to show movies, yeah, I think it's doable. Yeah, I, I, I thought what you said, Christy, was really interesting. It makes sense that if you build a movie theater in a place that has less competing attention um, events that, you know, there, there are people, like I linked to this in my article also, that there are people who are building movie theaters in cinema deserts, for example, specifically for the Latinx audience. And I wish that that got more coverage. I wish that we talked about that more in the film business because that is super interesting to me and God bless all those people. I, I hope that more people do that. Um, I'm lucky to work with the Nevada City Film Festival where the founder, Jeff, has built a, just a dream jewel box art house theater in that town called the Onyx. And it shows the films from the festival but operates as a year round art house theater. So I think that we need to find a more economically feasible structure, maybe something that is, as Scott says, a rational middle ground between a phone and an expensive movie theater. Is there some other physical structure that we could create that is just less expensive to run, that has less overhead, that is maybe a multi-purpose space? Maybe it won't be as pristine as the movie theaters that we're thinking of, like the Zigfield, but it will still provide a place for people to go to watch films collectively on a big screen and have that social experience that we're all missing. Yeah, Karen, I really love this idea um, because I, you know, I taught media theory for a long time. And one of the things that's really like true about content is we've moved from this idea that there's one monolith audience to many, many different audiences. And it really seems like cinematic exhibition is the last to get the memo on that, you know? And so this idea of having like um, a network of smaller theaters that are maybe like more connected to their audiences the specific types of audiences and able to like kind of uh, be the homes for content that fits those audiences, banding those places together as networks um, in these cinema deserts seems like a super uh, exciting and inspirational like path forward. Um, really but, audience, like the Wexner in Columbus, Ohio, you know, a very prosperous going concern. And they show all sorts of things. They show from Hollywood movies to extremely esoteric stuff. You know, uh, and but they've developed an audience, and and that audience comes because if the Wexner's showing it, it must be interesting, and that's the kind of reciprocal trust relationship which in in that kind of environment that you need to develop if it's going to be a successful operation. I think where if you vouch for a movie, the audience some some there will be a sufficient number of people that show up because you vouch for that movie, and they trust you. Yeah, and the Wexner's a whole art center, right? So there's lots of other ways for them to. And they're right on the edge of the Ohio State campus, which is a huge, let's face it, a huge influx of, of warm bodies uh, who are interested in movies. We have a comment and a question. Um, Leisha G loved the ambassador on Liberty Heights Avenue in Baltimore, which is covered in our flickering treasures exhibition. So if you're able to come, uh, you can check out what the ambassador was like. Uh, and then we have a, an anonymous question. Uh, we've covered some of this, but let's see what happens. Um, although people are sharing thoughts and feelings constantly on social media, what is lost? How do theaters foster community and meaningful shared experiences? Personality. Uh, make it intimate. 
have, I mean, the, the uh, Dan Talbot's New Yorker Theater had these large books in the lobby where people would write their, what they wanted to see, where people would write their opinions of the movie they just saw. Uh, you build a sense of, a, of a, an intimate conversation. I think that's the most important thing, which is lost, generally speaking, in corporate exhibition, you know? Have, like at the Arclight, where they would have people come out and introduce the films. Sometimes they're rushers. Most of the time they're rushers. Didn't matter. There was some, because the people that worked at the Arclight were passionate about the movies, generally. So they could come out and give some personal interest in why this director, why this screenwriter, why this actor. Something to build a sense of reciprocation where the people in the audience think, oh, they're just like me. So you feel comfortable in that environment. Um, I think another uh, thing worth plugging is that um, you can go to the, well, hopefully soon you'll be able to go to the Parkway Theater in Baltimore and see exactly how theaters can foster community and, uh, and a shared experience. Um, because I can't think of a better example um, near me, so. Thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me as a programmer, the thing that, um, you know, now that I'm here in Baltimore and before, it's always been about um, crafting specific invitations and really like creating space for folks to have an experience around the movie and not just the movie. So exactly what you said, Scott, like an introduction, having social time afterwards, um, and really paying attention to like who your audience is and like the things that they want to see. Like I think one of the problems with a uh, traditional cinema exhibition is that it really, it has a really like kind of monolithic idea of like what, what an audience is. And so I think one of the things that we're trying to do at the Parkway is really uh, learn more about all of the audiences that come into our space and, uh, and that now are visiting our space virtually and making sure that we have content that speaks to them by being in sort of a constant feedback loop with our audiences. The Film Forum in New York is another example of what we're talking about. And, and that's been yeah. a concern for a very long time. I'm sure they'll get right up to speed now that they're <sighs> Again, I, I, you know, that's, but that's a, that's a franchise because that's Bruce Goldstein and he knows his audience intimately and they know him intimately. And if Bruce says this film is worth seeing, they'll come in and he's got three or four screens now. So, you know, the success of one screen can cover the, the, the other screen that has four people inside the theater. Yeah, and they work like uh, what, how you were describing the Wexner for its community. Film Forum works like that for other art house theaters. If Fil Film Forum books it, many other art house theaters around the country will book it. And that's because, uh, you know, partly because they're in downtown New York, but the strength of their membership and how well they've cultivated that. So I think that, you know, to me, it's like every exhibition platform has its virtues and his draw and his drawbacks and with the virtual ones it's really about access you know but of course you lose some like because they're not the same of course you lose something but hopefully there will be enough different platforms out there for us to all watch the movies that the way that we want to watch them that's the best option yeah exactly Absolutely. well Karen, Scott, Christy, uh, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. And I see that Martha is here returned with us. Yes, I am going um, to wrap up. We are near the top of the hour and I'll just reiterate our thanks um, to you, Karen and Scott for giving us your time and um, your expertise. I think, you know, this is a really fascinating topic and one that very clearly pulls at everybody's heartstrings and it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, how things go moving forward. But um, I love the, you know, the connections that we all feel from movies are so important and hopefully something that will continue no matter the, the platform. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that um, the Maryland Film Festival is happening next month, um, May 19th through the 27th, online at the SNF Parkway Virtual Theater. Um, you can go online at mdfilmfest.com to take a look at everything that will be happening. Um, you will notice that um, Joe's uh, short documentary is making a premiere on the opening very exciting um, and something to take a look at. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to take a moment to share some big news. 
um, on a project that the Maryland Center for History and Culture is working on. Um, we're excited to announce that we're nearing the finish line of our current fundraising campaign, um, the Shaping the Future of History campaign. Um, so far, we've raised over $10 million towards our $12 million goal. Um, and we're seeking to shape the future of history, of how history is preserved and presented far beyond our walls. So connecting with new audiences and greatly expanding um, our national presence. So we invite you to join us in this endeavor and learn more about the exciting projects that the campaign will support. Um, if you head to our website, mdhistory.org, um, you'll find more information about the campaign, um, progress, um, projects, etc., cetera, and, and how you can get involved. Um, so thank you all one last time, um, and we hope to see you at our next virtual program. Take thank care. you. I've so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I really loved it.